Thank you all for coming. This is my uh, third year of talks about uh, Rapid App at Yepsi. And um, once again, like previous years, I have a action-packed uh, tons of content lined up that I hope you guys enjoy. Um, this is running a bit long, so uh, there probably won't be time for questions, but come and see me after if you have questions. And also always come into the um, Pound Rapid App channel on IRC and you can always ask questions in there. Okay, so um, some background info. Rapid App is uh, it's a development framework and ecosystem. It's toolkit, utilities, components, and apps. It's part of the larger DBIX class, Plaque, and Catalyst ecosystems. So some familiarity with those tools is assumed for this talk, but not st strictly necessary. And without belaboring the point, RapidApp is really good at database stuff. So previous talks, I've focused on giving examples of all the many um, interfaces which RapidApp is able to generate, um, lots of features showing all those things, giving examples of using existing databases and apps, um, snap-in pre-built PSGI components. Um, and if you haven't seen those talks, I, the videos are online. Uh, definitely check those out. Um, but for today's talk, we're going to be talking about new applications, development from scratch, and the development workflows that are enabled by Rapid App in order to do that. So our agenda, we're going to develop a new application right here today during this talk. It's going to be a server log analyzer, which I'll explain more in a moment. We'll bootstrap this with rapidapp.pl, which is the rapidapp bootstrap script. We'll create a model, i.e. database schema. We'll write some business logic. We'll customize some interfaces. And we'll go over the iterative development workflows that rapidapp enables. And then finally, we'll deploy our application with Docker. We'll talk about some of the features of the new Rappi PSGI image, which is available on Docker Hub, which can be used for production deployment and also for development, as this is now the fastest way to install the RapidApp stack. All right, so disclaimer, Tim Toady. This is just one way to use RapidApp for one scenario. And also, some of this that I will show will reflect some of my personal styles and preferences, um, which are by no means the only way to do things. Uh, extrapolating and adapting for your own workflows is encouraged. Um, RapidApp was designed from the ground up for flexibility, and that's actually one of the reasons that I haven't given a talk like this before, is I didn't want to imply, didn't want to pigeonhole and give the impression that this is the only way to use RapidApp, the only way to approach application development. It isn't. So let's talk about model-driven development, which is a general methodology um, that if you follow, RapidApp will provide the most useful benefits. And this simply means that you start your app, developing your application by creating your data model. That is the objects, the attributes, and their relationships that represent um, the core of your application. And when we're talking relational databases, which we are, these are tables, columns, and foreign keys, among other things. Then you write your business logic and your interfaces um, after you've created that model. And um, when you follow this approach, this is the stage where RapidApp is most helpful, is in creating these interfaces. So um, also we want, what I want to talk about and show is the iterative development process in the real world of, of developing an app and modifying it, is as you go through this process, you will realize that your model is inadequate, and then you come back around and you start back and update the model and continue to do that. So this being a software conference and this being a talk partially about style, I should probably mention that no, I do not advocate actually using GoTo in your code. So let's fix that. Whew, that's better. All right, well, while we're editing pseudocode, well, at some, point, at some point we'll get to the finish line, so we should probably fix it that way. Um, but from my experience in the real world, the actual condition that ends development is this. As they say, great works are never finished, they're only abandoned. So Rapid App helps you get more cycles in um, before you have to stop. Okay, so let's talk about schema creation. 
Um, in the realm of, again, this is um, part of the uh, DBIX class ecosystem, and in that ecosystem, there's two general approaches for writing, a, for developing a schema. You can write your uh, DBIX class schema first by hand. So you write uh, result classes by hand, one per um, source or table. There's tools like DBIX class candy, which makes it a little less tedious. And then you deploy your, your, your schema to the actual database with the de deploy method. The other approach is to create the schema on the database first. So you use a database client tool or native DDL, which uh, DDL data definition language, these are, this is the SQL that uh, is your create table statements and the like. And then you generate your DBIC schema with schema loader. Um, so there's pros and cons of each approach. The um, DBIX class schema first. You're staying in one language, Perl. It's database agnostic, you know, it's the same code for MySQL, SQLite, Postgres. And it is the more ORM-y way if you're into that sort of thing. DDL first, though, is generally faster. It's less code. It's just faster to write. And you can also have more fine-grained control. You can t utilize fancy features of your database, triggers, special um, rules for how you set up your indexes <coughs> and, and what have you. Also, from my experience, it's, DDL is unavoidable. Um, in the end anyway, later on when you're doing migrations after you have deployed your app and you have uh, data out there and now you need to release a new version of your application and you need to change your schema, you know, yes, you can do things like use fixtures and DBIC migrations and copy code around and modify things and stay all, but generally you end up just doing alter table statements, so um, DDL. And another point, if you go with DDL first, you can still deploy your generated schema to another back end later. And this is, the, this is the style that works for me personally. I develop applications by writing, um, writing DDL in SQLite and then I deploy it to MySQL or Postgres later on for production and that works just fine. So for today's, for today's application and of course my time, the, this is the 24 hour mark, my time out for Oops, thanks. For today's application, I'm going to follow the DDL first approach, SQLite flavor, um, and we're going to use the rapid app bootstrapping helpers and utilities that are designed specifically for this workflow, which is we're going to develop an application by writing DDL and generate a schema from that. And then this also will provide automation for regenerating the database from the DDL over and over again for this iterative approach. So let's do bootstrap, let's bootstrap it. So the bootstrap script, rapidapp.pl, ships with rapidapp. Um, it's, it's based on the Catalyst bootstrapper, catalyst.pl, but it's significantly more advanced. It has the first argument that you pass to it is you give it a list of helpers, which are different modes that are available for bootstrapping an application that will jump you straight to different scenarios. Today we're gonna be using the rapid DBIC helper which is the most standard common uh, way that RapidApp is used. It bootstraps an application with the Rapid DBIC plugin, which just gets you straight to a main application interface with a navigation tree and tab content panel with menu points for each source from your schema. Then you supply the class name, um, same as catalyst.pl. We we're gonna call our application Rapid Demo Log View. I'll explain what this does in a moment. And then um, you can supply additional arguments to the helpers after the uh, double dash. So for today, we're going to be using this special option to Rapid DBIC, which is blank DDL, which is specifically it's going to bootstrap an application and set us up for this workflow for following this approach. So we're going to run this here in a moment. Um, but what this is going to do is it's going to create our application directory, same as Catalyst. It'll bootstrap our main application class, but then it'll also, it'll initialize the SQLite database. It will generate our DBIC schema classes, which are gonna be empty to begin with, as we're expecting. It'll generate our Catalyst DBIC model, as well as um, configs, which we'll see, uh, and then also give us this file um, to, to where we put our, our DDL, and then It'll also bootstrap with this updater script, which we can then call later on, and is what this will do is this will allow us to interactively bring our code forward after we make changes. So 
we can now edit, uh, edit our DDL in this one location, this one file, and then re-update and bring our code forward. And this solves the, ch the chicken or the egg problem uh, where you bootstrap, you bootstrap an application, but then you want to change things. Well, you're going to do re-bootstrap. Um, this solves that workflow for you. OK. All right, so let's, let's run it. So first, I should point out, if you run the rapidapp.pl script with no arguments, it'll give you some usage. And as you can see, there's different modes, different, different choices. Um, so it is very comprehensive. But we're going to be using this special blank DDL mode. So we'll run that. And um, there it's done. Uh, let's take a look at what it just did. So it's bootstrapped our application directory. This is a standard Perl distribution. We have uh, our lib directory, our main application class, which is bootstrapped. And again, it's Catalyst loading the, uh, the Rapid DBIC plugin, which that's the only thing that makes a Rapid App application a Rapid App application is loading one or more Rapid App plugins to a Catalyst application. That's what, how Rapid App works. And we've also bootstrapped our um, our DBIC schema. There's no schema result classes yet because it's blank. Um, we have our model, need that, which we'll look at here in a minute. And it's bootstrapped our DDL file, which here we can now start writing our schema, our create table statements. Well, what do we want to write? Well, before we know what schema we're going to create, we need to talk a bit about what our application is actually all about. So what is this? What is Rappi Demo Log? What is the scope of our application? So it's going to be a repository for web server logs. We want, to have, we want to browse query and do reporting on HTTP requests. And we're going to use the standard Apache combined log format, which I just chose this for an easy, straightforward model to understand, to illustrate the concepts, which is more the reason, rather than this being that useful of an app, um, people have uh, if you deal with web stuff, you've probably dealt with web server logs, uh, and there's obviously readily available sample data that we can use. Okay, so the Apache combined log format, it's a commonly used format, flat files, records one every request, one line, and it gives you logs, lines like this. You've probably encountered these if you do web stuff. This is a space delimited list of attributes that translate to um, these, these data points. So let's start. Let's start from there and let's start, let's create a table to represent these data points as our starting point. So we'll come back and so now we can create table, call it request log. Um, it's generally a good idea when it's not, although not strictly necessary, to always when you create a table to find a auto increment primary key, um, which this is how you do that in SQLite. Give it an ID column so it gets a sequential number every time a new row is inserted. And then after that, we're just going to create the, um, the attributes lowercase as uh, text, text columns for straightforward. Now, you may notice I'm a really, really fast coder. Like, I typed, I pounded that out so fast you might have missed it. Like, oh, right, if you blink, you might miss how fast I type code out. So full disclosure, I do have edits pre-recorded just so that you don't have to wait for me to miss a semicolon and, uh, and waste time with that. But other than that, everything that I'm doing here is absolutely real live, real time. We're really bootstrapping the application. We're really doing these things. And you'll have, um, you'll have access at the end. There's links to all the stuff that I'm doing today all the sequence of edits so that you can look at this later on. OK, so um, here's our first state for our table. Let's, and it, it, gives us, it gives us some explanation about what's happening here, just for help. Um, and it gives us the command that we run, the updater command that we can now run to do this regeneration. So let's go ahead and run that. CD into our application directory. and. We'll run this. Now it's going to warn that this is going to blow away the database, which we expect because we're in a development mode now. We don't have real data. This is for development. Once we release an application and we actually have customer data, now we have to do migrations. It's a much more complicated 
topic. But for right now, we're just regenerate. We want to rapidly regenerate these things. But it is going to warn you that this is what's going to happen. So it makes you type go. So we'll type go, and it'll run. OK, done. Um, now let's look at what that did. If we come back in here, we see that now we have it's generated a result set, result class for that table, and there's our, our columns that we created, uh, and it's also it's updated uh, our model config um, where this is uh, the Rapid DBIC plugin. There's extra metadata that you can define that controls the behavior of interfaces for these various models in, in the interface, uh, in, in the interfaces. And there's this, it's this config section called table specs. And um, this is, this um, table specs, these are actually all these values that are set up here, which again, this follows the, this follows the schema. This defaults, th these are actually all default values, but the reason that it uh, puts this here is based on user feedback. One of the most confusing things that people found difficult in using and developing with Rapid App is not understanding where all the different table spec options go, not knowing the difference between column level options and source level options. So the, the updater model script um, b puts in these default values sort of as placeholders to give you as a developer a hint of where you can edit your configs. And something very important that this does is this is a non-destructive update to where if we come in here and we modify these any of these values and then we run our update script later on, it will not clobber our existing values, but it'll uh, update, uh, it'll update the defaults uh, in line and intermix that with, um, with your, 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 your settings. And it was a pain in the butt to do that with PPI. So enjoy. Okay, so we've, um, we have our, we have our, our schema. Right, well, they're not, they're, they're, they're parameters that affect the GUI, right. but they're not entirely, and we'll see, we will see this in a little more detail, like if, you've, if you're familiar with it, if you've seen Rapid App already, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, if you haven't, you might not, you might be confused about what these settings do, but we'll see in a minute um, what, what these do. Um, but before we get to that, we need to, we need to populate our database with, with, with data. So um, for that, we're going to do. I'm going to do this with a um, a script. Uh, we'll create a script, and let's see. We'll say new file. Let's call this parse.pl. And we're going to write this script. Where did you go? And again, I'm a super super fast coder. Wham wham. So we're going to just set this up um, to read in log files as an argument. We're going to read it into a file handle. We're going to iterate the file handle. Um, and we're going to use this. One of the wonderful things about Perl is that, of course, there are modules already on CPAN to parse the Apache combined format. I grabbed one. Um, here's us simply using that to parse each of these lines into a hash ref and throw it into uh, an array. And um, we had, so far, we're not doing this is just straight, straight Perl. Um, we're not doing anything. Let's, you know, the process, let's dump that out and see what that gives us before we actually try to start throwing it into our database. Let's give that, a, we'll use handy dandy data printer. So let's come back over here and see what this is going to look like. We, first we need some, um, see, this, one thing I did not plan on is this angle. All right. Um, we have some sample logs that I'm going to just copy into the repo. And we, if we look at this file, we, let's see. we see that here, you know, the standard Apache combined log. So let's run that through our parse script. And that'll run through and then boom, it, it's, it's parsing it in. Okay, good. So let's, let's, put, it, let's put it into the database. Um, come back over. Um, 
Okay, so first of all, we need to, um, we need to lowercase the key names because the keys are capitalized for them, but I use lowercase, which is, again, uh, just a, a best sort of best practice convention to use lowercase column names. You don't have to, but I am, so we need to lowercase that to match. Um, and then we will load our application, and this is straight Catalyst uh, DSL use. Um, we'll get our result set object, which, again, this is the Catalyst and DBIC DSL. And then we'll just call populate. That should populate this in. So let's see if it works. So now we'll run our script again, except this time it's going to load our application. And OK, it seems like it worked. Well, let's see. So we'll plaque up and take a look. Localhost 5000 by default. OK, so here we have our application. Let me see. Uh, a little bigger. We have just one one entry request rows, and we see that we have our data in there. So it worked. All right, but we can do a lot better than this. Um, so far, these are just text columns. We can st we're still getting this a lot further than just working with the, the log file. We can sort. We can build. Uh, query conditions, and again, I'm not going to take time to dive into all the many features that are generated by RapidApp. Again, check out specifically last year's talk for all the examples of the rich interactive capabilities that this interface gives you out of the box. Um, anyway, so we have, we have some capabilities, but um, we can do better. One, like this date format is not that useful um, because one, the, the, uh, the day is, comes first, so sorting on that doesn't sort by anything useful. Um, and, you know, there's other things where, so we're not, so, so far we're not using the relational part of the relational database. So, like, for instance, um, one of the attributes that comes in is status, HTTP status code. So we know in advance, we know in advance what these possible values can be. So we can make that into a foreign key and, and do some other things. So let's, let's hop back in to our DDL and, um, Let's start, let's give some column types. Uh, so we'll set some lengths, for instance, set some nullability, um, make our status and bytes integer columns, and change, uh, change the date column to be a date time field. But then this is going to require, this is obviously formatted differently, so we're going to have to now hop back over to our script and we're going to have to parse that. So this is just, um, parsing that format and converting it into um, the proper uh, SQLite uh, database date format. And while we're at it, let's consider those dashes that we saw. Those are undef. Um, so let's delete those keys. And um, let's, we have our, H, our status column. That's, let's make that a foreign key. So let's create, let's create another table. We'll create an HTTP status table. Um, with the code and then give a description of what those codes mean. And we can go ahead and, we can go ahead and pre-populate that because it's static. We already know what HTTP status codes are. So we can go ahead and insert those values and populate them right here. Again, it's just one way to do it. We could have also done a population within logic within our DBIC classes. Again, more than one way to do these things. So we have our HTTP status. Now let's, um, let's convert status into a foreign key. So now it's a foreign key that references that. Okay, so let's, let's regenerate and give this a try. So, and this time we'll give it, we'll give it tech tech go, so it doesn't ask us to confirm. Regenerate. And, um, Let's parse again because we just blew away our database, so it's empty now. All right, let's plaque up. All right, so we're getting somewhere. Um, now we see that we have date columns. How well can you see that back there? Is it too small? Yeah, it's good. Maybe a little bit bigger. Now we have date columns. We can sort by actual date column. If we build, if we build a filter, um, 
we can do it based on, um, and, and this is you know, part of the benefit of Rapid App is it understands these data types. So because it knows that this is a date column, it's going to give us date specific capabilities. So like we can say after, and we can have a, a calendar date selector, and it also supports stuff like relative dates, where we can type in a relative date in a syntax, and we can select minus two weeks. All right, and then that's, that's filtered it down for us. And then we also see our status column now. It's still there, but now there's a little magnifying glass next to the values, and that's because it's a foreign key, and it's pointing to the related row. And we can actually click that to follow over there. So here is a row um, for, the, for the 200 row, and we see the other direction. We have um, request rows. This, we have three columns here. We only, if you remember, we only, created, we only created two columns, but there's three here. This request logs is the multi-relationship, which is the inverse of the foreign key that points back so we can see what are all of the request rows that point to us. And like we see here, 872, and we can follow that um, and go to just a grid of, the, of specifically that set. Um, and we can look, of course, our, we have two tables here now, and, and we can, you know, here's a view of all of our status codes. And this, this virtual column is sortable, so we can sort, and it's, it, it's the value that it represents is a count, and it's a link to that set. So we can see, you know, 872 okay, 558, 307, and we can look at, let's look at just those eight records that were 404, and that pulls that up for us. Okay, so we're getting somewhere. Let's, um, back to the table spec. So you asked about confusion. What is these ta table spec options? Um, so um, t table specs allow us to define extra metadata that's relative to the interface that's above and beyond what the schema cares about. Like our database doesn't care about render, about the render function. Our database doesn't care about those um, front end features. Um, but we do. So we can set, and there's some examples that are set here, like you can define a renderer, which is a JavaScript function name if you define in your environment. And then it will, when it's rendering that value, it will pass it through that function. And then there's also, um, pre-built what we call column profiles that give us um, the ability to set, set uh, multiple options according to some scenario. So like for instance, we have our bytes column, um, there's a column profile file size, which says this is, a, this is a column that contains a file size. So it's gonna automatically set up for us a, an appropriate render or an appropriate validator for that type of input. And we'll see that work. And then there's also um, predefined defaults for like column widths, default headers, which you can actually change some of these things in the interface. Um, let's set some other options. Um, we're not, for our data, we're, there's not any ident or auth user values, so let's start those off as hidden, for instance, and we can say hidden one. And this is, there's extensive list of, of table spec properties that, to, to tweak these things. Um, that you can see uh, in the manual online, the table spec manual for, uh, at Rapid F on MetaCPAM. Okay, so let's, um, we can do more also. We, um, we created a foreign key out of our um, status. Uh, let's create a foreign key out of, um, let's create a foreign key out of the host. So let's create another table, host, and make it a foreign key also. Now, um, this time we have to, um, we're gonna have to make some changes to our parse script because we're gonna need to pre-populate. Um, we don't know the values in advance, so we need to handle that some way. We could, and again, there's multiple ways to do this. I'm doing it here in the script to make it simpler and quicker is we will iterate and before we, before we populate, we will pre-populate using find or create, again, this is DBIC, DSL, straight um, stuff. Find and create, find or create a row for the first time we see an, an IP address. And since we're doing two steps here, let's go ahead and add some print lines uh, to show what that's gonna look like. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's regenerate again. 
I'm just gonna run those things. Let's parse back in and see what we've got now. Host rows, request log rows. We reload back to now we see aha uh -huh, our host column is also a foreign key with a, a magnifying glass to be able to follow over and we can look again and just like just like um, our status table we have the reverse relationship of this which are all automatically set up just by us defining that foreign key it knows these these by directions um, and you know and that's sortable as well and we can see let's see just the rows that this, this host requested. So we're getting somewhere. Um, and then we could also, you know, again, as we continue to follow this, this iteration, um, you know, you can, we could have some asynchronous um, doing reverse lookups to populate the host name column, and we can continue to uh, develop out our application. Um, so back to the config of our interfaces, like talking about interfaces now. Um, there's different options that you have for these interfaces that are, are developed. So Rapid App, a lot of people ask, well, isn't Rapid App just a CRUD tool? Is it just giving me these CRUD interfaces? I thought you were talking about custom applications. Well, this is a base that it provides for you um, that, you can, that you, can, you can customize and extend and control. So every, each, each source, um, and this is part of the Rapid DBIC conf config plugin in the, in the DB model, um, gets created with a module class and this is the class that it uses and this is also bootstrapped with the application and we'll look at that in a second to customize that and then also we have grid params where we can supply options to the constructor of these objects when they're created and we have this special star defaults means that it's going to supply these options to every single um, every module that gets created one for, for each source um, so let's for start it this application, it probably doesn't, wouldn't make sense for this application in the real world to be editable because um, it's reporting, but let's make it editable anyway. And it also, you have some, some hints here um, that in order, to make, in order to make it editable, you simply uncomment out these lines. We have these call spec, these call spec configs, and there's, there's four of them for each of the CRUD modes. Define the rows, the, the columns that you want to select, including, including joins. Um, so star means all local columns, um, and we can, so the defaults, defaults applies to everything. We can then say, well, I want to override constructor options for just the request log source by defining that. So that means it'll use this value for include call spec, and this is how we specify a join, and is what this will do is it will um, include all local columns and then include um, the description column joined through the status relationship, which, which now exists as a relationship. Um, and we can, you know, you can specify joins multiple levels deep, you can, it supports wildcards, you can do all sorts of exotic configs um, just at that level. Um, so while we're turning on editing, let's talk about some of these, uh, another example of what are these high level um, interface options that are controlled by some of these table spec configs. And again, Rapid App tries to conceptualize the high level, the, the, the intent of the model. So if we're editing, if, if we're in the paradigm of modification, if we're going to modify a foreign key, what is it that we're actually doing when we're modifying a foreign key? What we're really doing is we're selecting from a related, from a row in the related table, right? That's the thing that makes sense. So the kind of interfaces that Rapid App is going to present for you when you want to edit that is going to be a selection dialog to be able to select from this related row, related table. And now there's multiple ways that we could envision that. You know, this could be a drop down list is a simple case, but for more complex relationships, you might want a more full blown uh, interface to be able to actually select from a grid to see when you're editing that. So um, by default, Rapid App gives you, um, if you don't configure anything, it gives you a grid so that when you select, you can see all the columns of the remote row and you can select the one that you want to represent that foreign key. But there's other high level modes that it provides for you. Um, and these can be set by 
auto editor type, which we're going to come in here and we're going to set, we're going to set on the status column. And the default, there's several auto editor types that are available. The default is grid. There's also drop down, which is just a static drop down list. And then combo will give you a drop down list, but with type ahead search. Um, so we can say that we want to use that. And that's not the default because, again, a single column might not be enough to identify the row that you want to select. And the row that it shows um, in that drop down is going to be the display column, which we have set to, to code. So that means that the value of this drop down is going to be these rows, and we're going to just see the code. Um, code column. So let's talk about another feature um, that tie into this. One of the other things that the Rapid App supports is this ability to define virtual columns, which are SQL snippet based columns that you can add on. It's basically the same, the, that re the request log multi-relationship is an automatically generated virtual column, but you can generate your own virtual columns as well. Um, so here's a, you define this in the virtual columns section, then source, and then names of the columns. So here we're going to define a new virtual column code <coughs> underscore desk description. And um, we specify a SQL um, and self represents the, the, the current row. And so this gets substituted for the alias for the current row when it executes the query. Um, and this is, this is specific to the engine. So that's one thing this doesn't, you have to, um, different backends do this differently. So this is an example of a concatenation, double pipe is concatenation in, um, SQLite. So um, this means that we're going to take code, we're going to concatenate it with a space and a dash, and then we're going to concatenate it with description. And then we can even use that as the display column. We can use that virtual column as the display column. So now when we are going to select from that, um, we can um, see that value. And so let's look at that. Before I fire the app back up to show you, one other thing to point out, so remember I mentioned this, um, this updater does not clobber your settings in the ta your table spec configs. And it actually, this, um, it has several options that we've just been calling, I haven't explained. The, the from DDL option means regenerate the database and the DBIC schema from the DDL. And then config means update the table spec config. So we can just update the table spec configs and it'll just do that. And if we come back and we look what that's done for us, um, we can see that um, it's now created code description because we basically we defined code description and it saw that in there. And so it gave us a spot for that um, so that we can, and we can, you can apply the same properties, headers and renderers and profiles. You can apply to this virtual column like you would to any other column. Okay, so let's take a look. Right, let's refresh. Okay, so now we will come back in. Let's go back to request log. Um, we see that we have editing capabilities. Like there's different things you can do it. Um, inline editing um, and when we change, this is a foreign key. So if we want to, let's say we want to, we want to change the host. We select to edit that. We can pick a different, a different remote row, and that'll update that foreign key to be that. And then status. Remember, we um, now see it's instead of just saying 200, it's saying 200 OK. And that's because of that display column that we set. That's that virtual column, which is a concatenation of, of multiple columns. And now, if we edit this, this is a combo box dropdown, which is what that all this was enabled just by setting that auto editor type. Um, and we can select, and we can also, we can type and search, and we can even type ahead search in that virtual display column. So we can, you know, type in for internal server error, and we can select uh, to change that. Okay, so we're getting somewhere. Um, now we're, we're building an application, and you can have m multiple iterations of this. Um, we want to, the common thing that you want to do with an application, we want authentication. We want a user database. We want to protect our application. Um, so Rapid App provides uh, high-level plugins that let you jump straight to certain scenarios, and they just auto-configure things. Like you could roll your own, you could roll your own authentication, 
or you can use some of the ones that are built in by RapidApp. And we have a couple plugins um, that we actually want to be looking at. So right now we're just loading the, um, the Rapid DBIC plugin. Let's load a couple other plugins that are provided. AuthCore automatically gives you a user database. NavCore gives your users customized per user saved searches. And Core Schema Admin um, gives us an interface to edit the user, the user database. And all this does is this sets up the standard authentication um, plugins that come with Catalyst. So if any of you have experience with Catalyst, there's Catalyst plugin authentication, Catalyst plugin authorization roles. It sets up that, that stuff for you and gives you that environment and then also automatically generates with these, these core schema plugins, automatically gives you a persistence database to handle all that stuff for you. You don't always want to use it, but it's sometimes very handy when you do. So we have just enabled, all we've done is we've just added these, we've just added these three lines. That's all we've done. Let's restart our app. <coughs> Reload. And now, just by doing that, now we're presented with a login box. And by default, when a brand new database is initialized, it creates one username, admin, password, pass and we can log in. Uh, and so we see now there's some more things that we have. Um, we have this section. We also have our core schema um, where we can configure things. So like there's automatically gives us roles. So we can define a role. Um, by default, it gives you administrator. And there's certain built-in things um, that that will do. So for instance, automatically with the administrator role, um, only administrators will get access to core, schema, to core schema, and that's how the core schema admin pl plugin works. But you want to, we want to write our own custom uh, authentication. We want our, our, own, our own custom authorization rules. Um, we can do that based on, we can leverage this system, and we can write code in the same manner that we would in Catalyst um, if we set up this whole roles uh, database this, in the standard way. So let's add, let's add a role. Let's call it... Um, Let's call it code 200. And let's give it a description. Let's say that this is the role. We're going to say we're going to use this for um, 200 requests. All right. So we'll save that. Come to our users. Let's create a user. So we can create a user. Let's call him Joe. Let's give him a password. And by the way, I should point out these different dialogues and interfaces, RapidApp uses its own stuff. This set password dialogue is actually just an example of an editor. So in the table spec configs, you can say, here's a renderer, here's a validator, here's an editor, um, and these are, are drop-in. So the pass, password editor is a pre-built editor that you can use um, that gives you, that gives you um, a password that you confirm. So let's give him, we can, um, the roles is a many to many, so we can select multiple roles, but we, let's not give him administrator, but let's give him, let's give him code 200, okay? All right, so let's save that. Okay, but now it's not doing anything. So he has that role, but it's not doing anything. So let's say we wanna hook in, we wanna hook in code um, to actually do something about this. Um, remember how, if we come back to our model, remember how I said, um, that we have this grid class. This is, this is the class that is used um, to create each of these modules, which provides its own DSL. Um, and you can create, you can extend and you can create, um, and there's a whole um, class hierarchy of, of modules that are based on, uh, there's data, data store based modules, and then from data store modules, there's grid modules, which is what we're using as a grid, but then there's also data view um, modules, which can be arbitrary HTML instead of a grid, but still backed by the same column model, still backed by the same stuff. Um, so we can go in our, um, when we bootstrap, it bootstraps this module and um, out of the box it does nothing. All it does is extend, extend the version from, um, from the um, wrap it up distribution. Um, but we can, we can customize this and extend this, um, and it's a moose, moose class. Um, one of the things that we can do is let's add, um, let's add some code on the back end. Part of the DSL that's provided here is um, if you define result set, um, 
then it will every every request will go through a result set. So we can add logic in here that says that we're going to filter out 200 unless the user has administrator or code 200, right? And add that on there. And now if we restart and let's log in as another user, use another browser. We'll log in as Joe. Right, notice he doesn't have the core schema admin. But if we look at request roles, well, he sees 200. Well, that's because we gave him the role. So he has the role 200. So let's, let's take it away from him. Now if we come back, and now if we refresh, those have disappeared. Um, so there is um, running short on time. Lots of, this is just the, the, the beginning foundation. You can um, extend these and there's a very rich, robust uh, uh, DSL. But let's move on um, in the few minutes that I have left. Let's talk about uh, Docker. Um, our live demo. So wrap it up with Docker. So with a traditional installation, cpanm, it's gonna pull the whole missing dependency tree to your system. This can take a long time. RapidApp has a huge stack with Catalyst and DBIC. This can take over an hour. And it might fail because sometimes upstream CPAN distributions are broken. So very annoying. So with Docker, we distribute this um, new image on Docker Hub, which is Rappi PSGI. You just run Docker pull, and this gives a full pre-installed image of uh, the Rapid App stack pre-installed, and we release a new. I release a new version of Rappi PSGI with every Rapid App release on MetaCPAN. So you can always run this and have the latest, the latest version of the full stack already installed. And this just takes seconds to install any box that has that has Docker on it. It's a known tested working state, and it's isolated from the rest of your system. Some good benefits about that. So um, the Rappi PSGI image, public image. It actually runs any PSGI application, not just Rapid App. It has lots of functionality. You can use your own Docker file or use it directly as a container. What, the way it works is it automatically runs an app.psgi. In other words, it plaque up an application if you mount it to the special directory, which we'll look at in a second. It uses a high-performance pre-forking HTTP server, Gazelle. It will automatically install dependencies for you if you define a CPAN file. Lots of options. It's well-documented. Um, and if you look on Docker Hub, um, you can read all kinds of options that this gives to you. Lots of cool stuff. Um, so an example container setup, um, a Docker create command. Uh, <coughs> this is, again, standard Docker options, the image that we want to use. And the magic here is that we're using, uh, we're mounting a volume. And basically all you need to do to use this is you mount the root of your application directory on slash opt slash app. And then when you start that up, um, it will look for an app.psgi and it'll fire up um, your application. And here we're mapping port 5000, which is the standard thing. And um, I like to run that with log view. I, would, I could, could run this and show you that it works, but I only have a few minutes, so I'm going to skip that. Trust me, it works. You can tr try it. Um, then what you can do is you can run, when you have a, this running container in the background, you can get a shell in it by running this exec command. And again, this is all straight Docker. You can also, you can bootstrap a new application using Docker as well. Um, instead of mounting an existing app, you can create a brand new empty directory and then run Docker create and mount that new blank directory on opt app. And if, if it doesn't find any, uh, app.psgi, it will just sit in a stop state. And so then you can, you can jump in to your application with um, this exec command. And from within that shell, you can bootstrap right there. And it will automatically, it, it's smart enough to know that it's in this Docker environment. And it will, it will bootstrap your application to opt app, which if you have mounted there, then that works there. It has some, um, there's other commands that you have in there. You can, there's some basic process control to start or restart your app without having to restart the whole Docker container. Um, and you can run those commands in there. So then deployment, um, the standard way that you deploy 
with Docker is um, an example for Apache, an Apache virtual host. This could be Nginx, you know, it, with its syntax, is um, you do a proxy pass where you start your Docker container on your system, then you have your forward-facing website, and you use whatever semantics your web server has to map some path on your public website to the application running on um, whatever um, port you've chosen. In this case, for this example, is 5,000. And the same thing works for. Um, so links, uh, everything that I've done here, um, you can also look at rapi.io slash YN 2016. This slideshow is on GitHub. Um, the demo app is on GitHub. Um, here's the link to the Docker Hub image for Rappi PSGI. The Rapid App website. Uh, the IRC channel, again, if you have questions, the best way to ask questions and get help is to come into Pound Rapid App on irc.perl.org. And then in case you're cu curious what I was doing to cheat these edits along the way, I wrote this simple script that um, allows me to key up and key down to cycle through checked out um, refs. And that is of the Rappi demo log view um, repo. So you can, if you look at that repo, every one of the edits that we just went through today is represented not only in a commit, but a tag, a numbered tag in that repo. So you can follow along and reproduce everything that I did here. And I just am right at the end of my time. So thank you very much.